Welcome to Central United Methodist Church on this blessed Sunday morning. May God richly bless you. Working with our volunteers and faithful partners, we are now providing more meals each day and more days each week. Due to the current government restrictions, our meals are currently available on a takeout only basis and are provided without cost to anyone who comes to our door. If you would uh, like a hot, nutritious meal, Central United Methodist Church is serving Monday through Friday, plus the first two Saturdays of each month. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday is a dinner meal from 4 to 5 p.m. Lunch on Tuesdays from 11.30 to 1, and the first two Saturdays of each month is a breakfast from 9 to 10.30. We thank all of our dedicated volunteers and partners for their tireless efforts and pray God's rich blessings on everyone coming to Central to receive a meal. Sharing of our joys and concerns. We continue to lift up all those in our community, our country, and the world who are being impacted by the coronavirus. We pray for God's support and protection of all the doctors, nurses, policemen, firemen, and other emergency workers who must work in the midst of this deadly virus. 
Join me in our opening prayer. Lord God, you who created us and redeemed us and sustain us, we rejoice that you have chosen us to be your own and that you visit us and dwell with us and open to our to us the ways to abundant life we are full of awe and wonder at what you have done and what you continue to do by your word the heavens and the earth were made by the bounty of your mercy in jesus christ we have been born to new life your spirit fills the whole world with your loving kindness and gives us the power we need to be your witness and to lift up your holy name Blessed are you, O God, and blessed are all who live in you. Help us today to joyfully proclaim our faith and to worship you as you desire. Bring us closer to you and to one another and in our prayers and our thanksgiving, our hearing and our speaking and our giving and receiving. Make us more completely thine. We ask it in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. This morning is from Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20, and our message title is Dress in the Armor of God. Bow with me. Gracious and loving God, we are called here for a reason. We are called to dress in the armor of God. We ask, Lord, that you teach us what you want us to know how you want us to dress in the armor of god and to be able to serve you in honor and in glory in jesus precious name we pray amen one of my favorite comedians was danny k anybody remember danny k <laughs> I loved his movies, and one of my favorite was The Court Jester. In this movie, Danny Kaye is a volunteer with the Fox, a Robin Hood type character who was trying to protect the rightful heir of the throne. Danny Kaye takes the place of a new court jester, Geronimo. The Get to gain access to the throne and the key that will let the fox and his men into the city through the secret, through the secret town. It's all typical Danny K. Fair. One of my favorite scenes is the tournament and the duel to the death for the hand. Of course, it's all set up by the fake king's henchmen. They think Gwendolyn is between Giacomo and Griswold, another knight. Of that, Danny Kay is really the fox. Of course, everyone else knows that Danny Kay will be slaughtered, so a secret plot unfolds to save him. The fake king's daughter arranges to save his life because she's in love with him. His main servant, Griselda comes to Giacomo with the news. The plot gets thick and so does the puns and the jokes and all the shenanigans and confusion. I love that scene because I think it describes life. Have you ever noticed just how confusing life can get sometimes? The simplest things can all of a sudden become so complex like the recount in Florida some time ago. It should have been straightforward, right? But no, it got more and more confusing with dimpled chads and hanging chads and dangling chads. 
add to it the media, the political parties, the pundits, and the candidates, and you have a three-ring circus. Or like driving with a car full of kids. And I know this one personally. My favorite excuse given for speeding that actually worked was uh, from the father of six who was pulled over for speeding. The kids, even though dad had told them to be quiet, was hollering and screaming and fighting over something. When the patrolman asked him why he was speeding, the father said, I was trying to get away from all that and pointed to the kids, and guess what? It worked. <laughs> Don't you wish you had something to get away from all of this? As much as the commercials tell us, Calvon doesn't work. Don't you wish you had a suit of armor or some sort of invisible shield to protect you from all the confusion of the world? Wouldn't it be great if you could get up every morning and put on this special suit that would protect you and your family from the confusion, the harshness, the brutality, and the coldness of the everyday world? Well, we may not have a physical suit of armor, but Paul describes the spiritual armor that is designed just for that purpose. The world tells us to dress for success, but listen to how Paul tells us to dress for faithfulness. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 tells us, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your seat, feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always preserve in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known the boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. As we dress for faithfulness in the armor of God, let's look at defense, offense, and present. First, let's look at defense. Most of the articles in the armor of God are for defensive purposes. They are to protect the soldier. We're all concerned about that kind of protection, even in everyday life. We have computer firewalls and antivirus software to keep folks from getting their important information stolen and to stop malicious infections from those who simply want to cause problems for others. We have security systems in our homes and in our cars. We have fire alarms and reindeer. We get vaccinations from disease. We protect our eyes with sunglasses. We have metal detectors at our schools and airports. Let's face it, we haven't felt safe in the U.S. since 9-11. If we're honest with ourselves, there's a part of us that is waiting for the next attack. 
All of these things are defense. They are there to protect us. Paul says we should protect ourselves spiritually too by daily putting on the armor of God. Number one, the belt of truth. In Roman armor, the belt protects the midsection from the waist to the knees. It was considered fighting dirty to strike in that area, but because fighting was fierce and dirty, some protection had to be developed. Soldiers didn't go into battle wearing something that looked like skirts because it was fashionable. The leather and the metal strips and the belt were for protection. God has crafted the finest and strongest spiritual armor in the world. And one of the best pieces of his armor may be the simplest and the smallest, the belt of truth. One of the best defenses we have against evil, which distorts everything, is truth. Consequently, the best witness is to live truthfully and faithfully. We're called to live a life of integrity. Gird yourself with the belt of truth. Number two, the breastplate of righteousness. In armor, the breastplate was designed to protect the vital organs, especially the heart and the lungs. For us, the spiritual armor protects the vital center of our faith, the heart of our faith, which is righteousness, or simply right living. Being, being righteous is simply being faithful. Being faithful always asks, well, what I do bring pleasure to the Lord. Many a Christian has fallen by the wayside because they let corruption enter in. They let unrighteous thoughts and desires enter into their hearts and minds, or they go back and pick up the garbage left, up, left at the foot of the cross and they burden their lives. That clink in the armor is enough to bring them down. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Live faithfully. Shoes, number three. I think it's interesting that Paul says, put on whatever shoe works for you. Put on whatever shoe facilitates your purpose, which is to spread the good news of the peace of Jesus Christ. Isn't it kind of odd and ironic that Paul talks about the peace of Christ in the midst of this militaristic analogy. Paul knew that the peace of Christ is different than that of the peace of the world. The peace of Christ is an inner peace and a spiritual peace. When we have that, we can proclaim Christ. The good news lives in us and through us. Choose whatever is comfortable and enabling, but put on shoes that help you spread the good news of Jesus. It doesn't matter if it's running shoes, football spikes, work boots, flip-flops, sandals, or ballet slippers. Every person in every profession or walk of life can witness to the peace of Christ through being faithful. Number four. The shield of faith. The shield protected the soldier from arrows, rocks, and darts. The shield of faith protects us from the flaming arrows and doubt caused by misfortune or calamity or the sin of another. The shield of faith reminds us that God's promise to be with us, even to the end of the age, and God has never reneged on a promise. Number five, the helmet of salvation. We all know what helmets were for. The, they help protect the head. Likewise, the helmet of salvation is there to protect your mind. Our minds are both the strongest and most vulnerable part of our faith because we can talk ourselves into just about it. We can justify nearly anything or any action if we try hard enough. We fool ourselves all the time. That's why we need the helmet of salvation to protect our minds from distraction 
and discouragement. Put on the helmet of salvation. These five pieces of the armor of God are for defense. <clears throat> Offense. I think it's interesting that Paul only lists one piece of offensive equipment. The sword of the spirit, which he says is the word of God. There's an old saying that said, there's no defense like a good offense. Let me give you an example. While deployed in Afghanistan, a Marine received a Dear John letter from his girlfriend. In the letter, she explained she had found someone else. She wanted to end their relationship, and she wanted her pictures back. The Marine was crushed, but he rose to the occasion, like Marines always do. He went around to his buddies and collected all the unwanted photos of women he could find. He then mailed back about 25 pictures of these other women, along with a single picture of his girlfriend with a note. I don't remember which one you are. Please remove your picture and send the rest back. There's no defense like a good offense. <clears throat> the only weapon, so to speak, which we have available to us is the spiritual armor of God. Is the sword of the spirit or scripture the word of God? I know, I know some folks who think that scripture is a weapon and they rob people with it left and right. You know, the kind, judgmental and self-righteous. That's not what the scripture is for. Through the word of God, the spirit convicts. Through the word of God, God can and does change hearts. Look at Jesus' example. When Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, each time Satan tempted him, he responded with the exact same answer. It is written, and then he quoted scripture. You see, evil can't stand up to the word of God. And when you have God's word written in your heart and in your head, through study, it bubbles up when you need it the most. Plan a good offense. Study the Word of God. Read and study the Bible. Presence. The purpose of the armor of God is to keep you ready. Ready to do the work of a child of the kingdom. A soldier of Christ. And that work is very simple. It's frontline battlefield work. It's hard work. It takes stamina and willpower. It takes focus and a warrior's heart. What am I talking about? Prayer. You and I are called to kneel in the very presence of God and lift one another in prayer, making supplication for each other. One of my favorite stories is about the preacher who died and went to heaven. This preacher was known as one of the best preachers around. Thousands of people had come to Christ because of his sermons, and he knew it. St. Peter was showing him around, and they passed through this huge section of humongous homes. These things were so big, they were nearly castles, not mansions. Either outside or looking out of the window of each of them was a little widow lady or a widower or a teenager or a child. And they all looked somewhat overwhelmed by the size of their mansion. The preacher was getting excited. If these people, just your ordinary, everyday kind of Christian, got those kind of mansions, imagine what he was going to get. As they ended their trek through the neighborhood, they came upon a large Texas-style ranch. It was nice, but wasn't huge. It had everything you could imagine but it was nowhere near what the preacher was expecting. So he asked why. <clears throat> St. Peter sort of grinned and said, oh, we appreciate everything you did. You're a good preacher, and thousands came to Christ because of you. But truthfully, you were just the 
distraction. The real work, the tough work, was done on the knees of every one of those people we passed. They were our prayer warriors, and that's where the real battle was fought. Prayer brings us to the very presence of God. Through prayer, we are brought to the throne of grace, and we are enabled to stand before God, not presumptuously, but in all humility, and because we've been invited there. And once there, God wants to know everything on our hearts and minds about everyone we know and love, and even those we don't love. In conclusion, you and I have been called to dress for faithfulness, not success. We're called to live a life that is pleasing to God in all that we do. Jesus didn't die on the cross so we could be successful by worldly standards. Jesus died on the cross because of our sins, because we couldn't be faithful. God doesn't want us to pursue worldly successes. God wants us to pursue faithfulness, even in the midst of the confusion of life. Now is the time where we will receive our tithes and offerings of love. Reminder that church expenses like utilities and salaries continue each week, even when we can't meet together for worship. There are three ways to give. You can mail your checks with your offering envelope. You can drop your offering envelope through the mail slot in the 13th Street ramp door, or you can contribute by clicking on the donate button on our website, www.centralunitedmethodistchurch.org. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Prepare with me for the benediction. May God's creative spirit be with us in our hearts and minds as we leave this place. May God's creative spirit help us to see with new wonder the splendor of your creation all around us and inspire us to preserve and protect it. Go now in peace, love, and care for one another in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.